Welcome back everybody to Post Wrestling. It is John Pollock here alongside Kenny Omega. And I wanna let all of our viewers know that on Wednesday night, 7.30 p.m. Eastern time on TSN, it is Omega Man, a wrestling love story, uh, part of the Engraved on a Nation series that TSN has been producing. And Kenny Omega following the line of Jacques Villeneuve, Larry Walker, Donovan Bailey, you're in prestigious Canadian company. I certainly am. It's uh, it's still surreal to me, but uh, here I am sitting here on the on a on a seat with you and uh, talking about a documentary. So we're, we're coming up on it's almost been three months since yeah. your last match. Yeah, uh, has this been kind of a, a welcome break for you, or are you kind of getting at the antsy stage at this point? Because I've got to imagine this is one of, if not the longest, breaks. It in, really is matches for yourself. Absolutely, is one of the longest breaks. Um, yeah, even when I had knee surgery. Uh, it, I was rushed out in like a matter of two weeks. I had to make my return. So I never really get these huge gaps of time to um, to heal, to rest. And I like to say rest, but really, you know, we're trying to establish a new company. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I was named one of the executive vice producers. And it's not just a job title. You know, I'm actually working on stuff every single day and it never ends. And um, it's, uh, I, I almost prefer being busy in the ring rather than being busy in the office just because this is such a new confusing venture for me um but you know it's making me more multifaceted so it's a good learning experience and i just hope that we can um dot the i's and cross the t's in time for the the next big show and i want it to be the best first big show that we could possibly put on so it's got to be a little bit of a, a different mindset that today you know you might be tackling a project and it's going to take up a lot of hours but it's not that immediacy of going out, performing a match, getting that reception from the audience, the feedback afterwards. It's a lot of small wins, I'm sure, that you guys are accumulating, but yeah. it's all behind the scenes. The public isn't seeing it yet. It's right. all happening yeah. months down the road. Certainly. Yeah. Right now, it's just like, you know, even if it's just a matter of securing, you know, a particular talent that we really want to get. Okay, we got that talent. Okay, now that talent needs a visa. Now that talent needs, uh, you know, their paperwork done. Now that talent needs, uh, you know, all you know the scheduling done. And et cetera, et cetera. And then we have to secure the buildings, the, you know, the licenses, you know, the everything. There's so, there's so many layers to things that people don't realize go into to doing a show, especially when the onus is on you, uh, who has to work as a performer as well on said show. Um, but we're making sure to do it well in advance so that we can just focus purely on putting forth the best and most entertaining product, you know, when May 25th rolls around at MGM Grand. Are you the kind of performer that still goes back and you rewatch a lot of your stuff and specifically the Tanahashi match in January? Is that something you will sit down or is that uh, uh, difficult to sit and watch yourself in that light? It, it still is. Yeah. Like it's very rare that I watch my matches. Um, but there are times, for example, like at the Tokyo Dome, you know, we will finish um, at the show and I'm usually like the last guy that leaves the arena and, you know, I'll lead after with my friends or whatever. And when I come back home, it's there's the same day broadcast where they will usually they'll play the semi and the main event on TV in an edited fashion. So since it's on, you know, somewhat live, post live, near live, I, I, I do watch that. But I never really go back on the streaming service and watch my things unless I try something very new and I want to see how it came out. And then it's just like, do I leave it on the cutting room floor at that point? Or is there something I can button up and make look better? Um, aside from that, you know, it's even just with the documentaries, like I'm, I'm a shy guy, you know, I feel embarrassed. So it's, it's strange to watch myself. I, I was going to segue over yeah. that, what that experience is like being the subject of a documentary and have you watched it yet? Uh, I watched a very rough cut and, um, I, I was actually, uh, given the, the full version of the documentary during my flight but um you know i was just i was just tired so i fell asleep on that flight i haven't been able to see it yet and uh, i'm afraid to see it because again you know just it's i'm used to being the subject of a wrestling match maybe or you know a pro wrestling feature um that's very you know based in a in in the, the world of pro wrestling but now to kind of be in something completely different which is you know a a, a documentary, which just so happens to be about me in my pro wrestling role as Kenny Omega. It's, uh, that's new and exciting, but scary. Um, and you know, I've got a lot of friends and family that are, are eager to watch it. And I don't know, like, again, it just goes back to me just being real shy and just kind of like, you know, he, 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 you know, you know, leave me alone. So being that private person, yeah, I'm imagining there was a bit of a convincing process. Like what, what oh, yeah. is it, the impetus behind 
participating in a project like this where you are inviting cameras around you and you know for someone like yourself that is such a you focus so much on your performance yeah. uh this could obviously it could be a great reward but also a distraction at the same time yeah i mean what people don't understand i suppose you know if you're on the outside looking in is how difficult it is to sort of succeed and excel in a foreign country when you know you may not speak the language fluently or when you're just an outsider and there's a certain headspace I have to be in when I, um, especially during the time of the filming, you know, I was in a certain role and I was expected to perform to a certain standard and there's kind of like a certain process and a certain th way of things um, that, that I go about doing my daily business to make sure that I'm in the proper headspace, that I'm in the proper physical conditioning that I need to be in for my next big match. And I worried that if I had a camera crew following around me, you know, 24 hours of the day, that am I going to be able to eat properly? Am I going to be able to train properly? Am I going to feel that I need to put on a show for the cameras? And then was that going to affect my performance in the ring? So it was a very difficult process and decision for me to make when I was like, yeah, okay, we'll do this. On top of that, there's just a ton of red tape in Japan. Like the pro wrestling business and industry is very protected to outsiders. So I knew that even going into this thing, yeah, you can get some of my, you know, real life Kenny Omega, but you're not going to get the stuff backstage. You're not going to get our tour bus. You're not going to get, um, you know, a lot of the sort of candid, you know, ringside shots. Um, I think what they got, I, I'm surprised at what they got because they're even kind of against releasing, you know, any of their televised products. Um, just to be used uh, you know, other forms of media. But you know, um, from what I saw in the rough cut anyway, uh, they got a lot of the actual you know, licensed New Japan footage. So they did get a good um, look at, at how New Japan is shot and how the matches flow. And, um, is that kind of just embedded into the way things have always been done? Because you look at a company like New Japan, mm -hmm. and yes, they're attached to a network, but you're looking for this worldwide expansion, and yet they do put these borders up for something like this. Yeah, I mean... It's sort of like, you know, we want to, New Japan has, uh, very much has the, the mindset where, yes, we want to expand and we want to show the beauty of Japanese style pro wrestling and specifically New Japan pro wrestling, but we want to do it in our way and the way that we've done it since 1972. Um, and, and that being said, you know, there is very much that this is our world and this is your world and there can't be any overlap. And that's sort of what I, I knew existed from, from day one. And I knew that that was going to make this documentary, you know, a difficult task for, for the producers and directors and, all, and everything. Um, but again, I think they did a wonderful job with what they were given. And uh, they made uh, a lot of lemonade out of lemons. And um, I think we have a lot of good footage and, and key footage that, that is able to tell the story of myself and Ibushi quite, quite well. It, there's a really interesting line in the documentary when you're talking about uh, the story with Abushi and stating that in Japan, it's unfortunate that we often have to blur the line between fantasy and reality to yeah. get it across. And I just found it interesting that you used the word unfortunate because I think there's a lot of people in your industry that they enjoy playing with that fantasy with the public and mm -hmm. letting them in on certain elements and not. And I got the impression from you that, you know, it would be nice if we could be just so open about our craft. Right. Um, and maybe I took that the, the wrong way, but I, I found it interesting that there, there is still that divide that with pro course. wrestling it, and there's a certain appeal to what is real and what is, I guess you could call it case by case. You know, there are times when I, I really enjoy playing a certain role. Um, for example, you know, I had the, the big story with Chris Jericho and that was a, a huge blurring of lines and, uh, no one really knew what would come of it or what it would become. And for me, that was an exciting, exciting time in my career because we really made people believe again and we made people excited for something that they hadn't been in a long time. So that was a situation where I was like, you know, I love this and I could live in this world forever or as long as I'm a performer. But in the case of myself and Ibushi, it's like we had this, wow, it was a six year hiatus of we're not even involved in the same storyline, but yet we're not expected to talk to each other. We can't, um, we can't be seen in public together. You know, this is where like, it, it's, an, it's, that's sort of where, you know, we could draw the line potentially where it's like, we're not even involved with one another. So why, why is there this unspoken rule where we can't 
speak to one another? Why can't we be seen in public with one another? Um, but that that is the culture. That's the wrestling culture there. And, uh, you know, it's either just, it's take it or leave it. And, and this is how it is. It's different from how it is in America and how it is from Canada. But, you know, the Japanese wrestling style was a style that I love. And, and I decided to, to make Japan my home and, and the, the base of my career at that point in time. So you got to take the good with the bad. You know, uh, comparing yourself to another Canadian in Bret Hart, as he was uh, inching towards the exit of his departure from the WWF, he had a film crew around himself as well. Yeah. And the initial story, it turned into a very different documentary right. by the end of it. Wrestling with Shadows, right? Did you see any uh, like little parallels here? As you know, you're about to make the biggest decision of your career. Right. And here you are with, I'm certain that there is a lot of interesting footage uh, in terms of the, the lead up to January 4th and beforehand. I would imagine that there would be, and um, I, I do feel that we were more than likely wrapped when things got, before things got really interesting. Um, that would have to make for almost an entire new documentary, I would say, because um, again, my, my closing months and days before that last Tokyo Dome performance were very interesting. and. Uh, it would have been really cool to have some of the accounts from you know the people around in that situation and for people to know the true story but uh that's a story for a different day so yeah. a master of the tease right there okay. yeah <laughs> uh, you know as you are making this uh, huge decision and you've you stated publicly that part of joining AEW is that that door is still open for you yep. in Japan so it was obviously something of importance to you and i think most people looking at this situation look at it that new japan side why would, if you have access to this individual that every promotion out there would bend over backwards for, why, obviously they see that value. What, what do you see out of, like, what is there left for you uh, over in New Japan at this point in your career? Are there still goals and things that you leave on a, that were not accomplished? I mean, there's, I have a sentimental attachment to the country and to the people, of course. And, uh, to see the amount of joy that something simple like one of my matches can bring to a person in that country um, is really important to me. And even though I may not be able to accomplish many, you know, many more accolades and that I've checked off almost every box that there is to check in Japan, uh, it doesn't necessarily mean that I just want to pack up and move on. And, uh, you know, I'd love to keep coming back until, you know, I take my last bump to Japan. Um, but, you know, there are things that I feel that I, I still can do. And even I feel I have a responsibility to do in professional wrestling. And um, that requires me to take the next step, which is AEW, and um, pursue that to its full extent. Well, from what you can gather, and you don't have to share everything, but mm -hmm. why do you feel you haven't received that call yet? I mean, there is a big card in Dallas that mm -hmm. I, I think is very fair to say. The advance has been disappointing, and I would say if you surveyed people, you are a key reason not being part of that card. Why do you feel that there, that that connection has not been made at this point? If the option is there, <laughs> or is that a different documentary? Uh, you know, it, it's funny because I, I there are times when um, I'm not sure how you could this. This could be the wrong comparison, but. Um, if I were a parent and I had a child and it was his first day of school and you want nothing more than to be with that child on his first day of kindergarten class because you feel that you could help him, you can give him the answers and you can make sure that he's not bullied and you can make sure that he succeeds. And sometimes it's best to let the child experience everything on his own at first and so that he can grow or he or she can grow in, into the best person that they can become on their own. Um, I, I would very much love to be a part of everything, of everything. Um, you know, not just that, but I mean the Madison Square Garden show, the G1, you know, all those things. But um, then I'm burning the candle on both ends. And on top of that, you know, sometimes there might be a conflict of interest. I mean, I could go there, but there are all these storylines in place. And I think New Japan, with how they book so long term, um, they have a direction and a plan. And, um, you know, knowing that we have our hands completely full, over full 
with what we have to do. It's a huge undertaking. Um, it's probably best that we just focus on our own things for now and just know that on both sides, the door is mutually open. Are you aware of the, of the kind of impact that the, uh, that the Golden Lover storyline has had on, on people, especially fans in the LGBTQ community? Um, first and foremost, this is just a story that was very personal to us. But I just really wanted to not shy away from being a supporter of that community and not being afraid to do something generally in wrestling that just is never done. A major theme of all elite wrestling and in this documentary is in inclusiveness and making wrestling available for everybody mm -hmm. out there. Um, a, did you feel that message came across? Well, I guess you haven't seen the documentary, right. but from the overall <laughs> story, I think that was pressed very hard. And yeah. that, that seems to be something very important to yourself and to those that you're working with at All Elite Wrestling. Has that been something that goes back early in your career of some of making a wholesale culture change? Hmm. You know, at first, I wasn't even sure what I wanted to do with wrestling. I just knew that I enjoyed it and I knew that I could offer the world something different. Um... You know, going back 15 years or so, it was, okay, I'm an athlete and I feel that there are athletic things that I can do in the ring that no one else can do. So I'm just going to roll with that. I was very much just a, a one trick pony. Um, and then as I started to, I don't know, I don't want to say digress, but when I used to, when I found myself getting more broken and realizing that this isn't going to lend itself to a very long career if I just rely on sheer athleticism and stunts for all my big matches. I have to do something more. And I didn't have the answer. I didn't know what it was. I didn't know what I wanted to do. But I was very much just wrestling for me. Um, I feel like it was when I, I was wrestling for something higher and, and more than just myself is when I was able to take the next step and when I was able to evolve. So I really hunkered down and dedicated myself to developing DDT. When I made my debut there, we were wrestling in front of 200 people. And uh, we know when Koda and I, when we decided that yes, we wanna make this the next big thing, we wanna, we wanna make this you know, a feature promotion and not just some kind of like you know, underground indie. We went from those 200 people to selling up Budokan, which is just you know, a legendary arena, of course. And, um, even with New Japan, it's just like I saw the landscape there and I saw the potential with all this talent that they had and, and you know, the foreigners that they're using. And I had thought there's room for so much more and I want to be sort of the, the tether to the Western side. And, uh, you know, I, I'd, I'd felt that even though I was, I was good in the ring, you know, I had that little something extra that, that the other foreigners couldn't offer. And, you know, part of that was maybe that I could speak the language. You know, I could communicate my own words and ideas a little better than everyone else. Um, I had a passion for it. You know, a lot of people go to Japan and look at it as a stepping stone. They're thinking, okay, I'm just here because I can make some money. And, you know, it's a good in-between time before I go back to WWE. Or it's just, you know, they're just doing the wrestling thing. You know, they just love being on the road. Um, but for me, you know, it was always about, I don't know, just being like a soldier, being a, being a, I wanted to be a weapon for the, for the company, you know, use me to my full potential, use everything that I have in me to, to help your, your needs. And, um, at the end, I guess about 2016, 17, 18 ish, you know, I was, I was harboring a lot of, you know, emotions, you know, feelings of, of loneliness, pain, anguish, you know, things like that. And it wasn't until I tapped into those emotions, um, that I was able to really take, the true next step and kind of reveal, you know, the advanced level of Kenny Omega, um, where I was actually able to not only express myself through my ideas and my words, but through my performances in the ring as well. Um, things really started to come together to me and I felt like I had unlocked the caramel secret, so to speak, where it was like wrestling is, is now easy for me. It's like I've tapped into the matrix. And um, it's just because I feel that I'm more in tune with myself as a human, but also like I'm speaking to the fans on a different level as well. 
And I think um, the most important first step of that was to stop wrestling as a as an ego project for myself and stop trying to just advance my own personal life and my own personal gain and to try to help other people, whether it be, you know, the people in the promotion, the wrestlers that I'm working with, or just trying to help the fan that paid for a ticket that just wants to have a better day, you know, through watching our, our performances. Um, being someone that wrestles not for himself, uh, I think was the most important first step to getting to where I am now. Uh, two final things. Uh, we're speaking on a very interesting day. It was 18 years ago today, the final Nitro took place. Oh, and wow. For, for many people, I mean, that was, uh, I think the significance. I didn't know that. Yeah, that's uh, kind of Years cool. later, I think people look back at that date like, wow, it was big then. It was even bigger in hindsight. And that brings us to today yeah. with All Elite Wrestling that mm -hmm. I feel the audience, they are, they are looking at you guys for much more than just a great wrestling show of signing guys. I think they, so. They want this industry to change. And mm -hmm. is it a healthy amount of pressure that you guys have? Or is it sometimes daunting at the expectations are so high because you, you guys are perceived to have the magic wand that can make these changes that yeah. people have been looking in the United States and Canada for the last 18 years. And they've seen, they've seen hints of it, yeah. but no one's been able to replace that void. Yeah, I think, you know, um, the difference between ourselves and, and WCW, for example, is, is that um, we're not looking to compete with WWE. At least, you know, uh, a, a big handful of us aren't. You know, other people may have their own motivations or whatever. But uh, for us, we're very much focused on just becoming the new wrestling alternative. Uh, and I think in today's world, you know, with, uh, you know, digital streaming services and such, a lot of wrestling fans, they're going to watch everything anyway. And so, you know, I want people to enjoy their product if, you know, if, if that's what they're into, I enjoy it, watch it. Uh, I'm never going to try to do something to undermine what they do. I'm never going to try to do something and say, Hey, you know, this is a, a different take of what you did, except we did it better, you know, or, or whatever. Um, what we want to do is we want to present something completely new to the table and different. Um, and we want to even tap into a different demographic. I mean, I'm, I've always been, interested in the non-fan. Um, I, I mean, I, I love it when I, when I can have a wrestling historian and someone who, um, you know, has watched wrestling for longer than I've been alive, someone like Dave Meltzer, and, and he can appreciate my matches, um, you know, or, or any fan that has been watching wrestling all their lives, and they appreciate me just as a wrestler. That's great. But for me, uh, I'm trying to attract just your average Joe or Jill off the street, and have them watch a match or performance or even this documentary for example and they'll say you know what this is this is cool and i like it or you know of course the next best step after that is i like it and i'm actually willing to watch a show whether it be on tv or or on a streaming service or even show up to a live event and pay a ticket that's that's really you know the cool sort of power that we have in today's day and age is that we have a, a longer and, and more uh, diverse reach via social media and all that. So um, yeah, like I, I just really hope that we're not bound to just being a wrestling show. We just want to be a variety show that has wrestling on it and, and be universally entertaining for everyone. And the final thing, it goes back to a line Don Callis has in the documentary mm -hmm. about the fact that here is this guy who is a megastar within his industry yep. and yet can go back to Winnipeg and he's just, he's Tyson Smith. And yep. it, it kind of made me think of the destroyer who recently passed away. This guy who is yeah. this iconic figure in Japan, yeah. wrestling Ricky Dozan, Giant Baba. Mm -hmm. And yet he can go back to Akron, New York, and he is the swimming and wrestling coach and could kind of, and take off the mask and yeah, yeah. have that separation. Do you enjoy having that, that separation that you can flip the switch at a certain point? Because I feel in the next year or so, um, it's certainly going to penetrate much more as you're after these casual fans that you're right. going to be like that, that privacy is something you give up as you become such a yeah. major figure within your industry. Oh, that's true. Um, yeah. I, I mean, going back to Winnipeg, it's, uh, it, it is a, it is a um, metaphorical removal of the mask, so to speak. But even if I go in public now in Winnipeg, it's just, I will go, even if it's just to the grocery store, someone there will know me. If I go to the mall, you know, there'll be a handful of people there that know me. Uh, but everyone's really friendly about it. And um, it's, it's, it's nice, you know, it's, it's, it's different from how it is in Japan and, and it's different from how it is in America. 
Um, but as days go by, uh, people are kind of realizing that there's this Kenny Omega guy from Winnipeg who's also known as Tyson Smith, or vice versa, however you want to word that. Um, and and I will sort of take that in stride as AEW grows as a, as a promotion. And I definitely don't mind because um, everyone that approaches me or, or, or that I see on the street or wherever I go, they've been so kind and friendly and, and they're showing the, the kind of support that encourages you to try harder and to make sure that you're on your game. So I like it a lot. And, um, you know, if it wasn't for, for people like that, you know, I would never know just how much power professional wrestling has and that, you know, how, how, how we are reaching these people and how we are putting smiles on faces and how, you know, for example, I mean, there, there were times when I was just getting into the Indies and, and, you know, I would, uh, I, I would be an unknown. And, uh, if I was, if they knew I was part of a wrestling show, I could be a target. You know what I mean? Oh, you're a wrestler. Okay. Well try to fight me then or whatever. You know what I mean? And, and you, you'd almost get bullied for it. Um, I had instances like that in, in America and in the uh, United Kingdom where, you know, wrestlers were just kind of like gawked at and, and we, people wanted to challenge wrestlers. Uh, and now it's, it's just a completely new world. Um, it's, it's, it's so different. And, um, I really appreciate and enjoy this new change where if someone knows me, it's, it's like seeing a friendly face and like seeing a, an old friend. Well, uh, I want to thank you so much uh, for this time, Kenny. Once again, Omega Man, a wrestling love story. It premieres Wednesday night, 730 Eastern time on TSN, part of the engraved on a nation series. I really enjoyed this documentary. I think it's (laughs) it's something that you are, you know, setting out to kind of increase the the volume of of non-fans coming into the industry. And I think this is one of those instances that people are going to watch this. And it's not just a wrestling documentary. It's a much larger story involving some very unique characters that are, and I don't even, I don't say that in a disparaging way characters, but (laughs) certainly that is what people latch onto. And I think that this documentary accomplishes that. I mean, here's, here's hoping. I just, uh, I hope if everyone has some spare time in the day, just, you know, watch it. And if you can enjoy it, That makes me a happy camper, so thank you very much.